A little more than a hundred years ago, a gentleman from the United States went to see a performance of Lohengrin in the German city of Mannheim. And there, in a famous theater, surrounded by lovely bonneted ladies, and in the presence of a new masterpiece, he ought to have been transported. Instead, as he recalls it, the banging and slamming and booming and crashing were something beyond belief. At times the pain was so exquisite that I could hardly keep the tears back. As the howlings and wailings and shriekings of the singers and the ragings and roarings and explosions of the vast orchestra rose higher and higher and wilder and wilder and fiercer and fiercer, I could have cried if I had been alone. That excruciated American was Mark Twain, and all this and more he ruefully recounts in A Tramp Abroad. A century later, this American went to see Lohengrin in Mannheim, though not in the old theater. Shrieking and exploding American bombs had long since leveled that. And the opera made an entirely different impression on this innocent abroad. I was moved to tears, not Twainian tears of pain, but tears drawn by the same rapt response Twain saw about him a hundred years before. Tears drawn from the eyes by the overwhelming theatrical experience for which Wagner is famous. For what unfolded for some four hours before me was a myth come to life in glowing music and painted in light, the glint of silver armor lovingly reflected in the radiant shimmer of divided strings, the pre-Raphaelite blue of a stage picture night delicately underlined by hushed woodwinds. Most of the drama then spoke to my gentler feelings, but there are two worlds in Lohengrin, the mystical legendary and the staunchly historical. And near the close of the evening, when the Brabantians joined the Saxon forces to march against the heathen, the brassy glory, the clangor, the panoply and pageantry of it all was almost enough to pull me from my seat and turn me crusader. Perhaps because I am part German, as Sam Clemens was not. There is nothing, Sam remarked, the Germans like so much as opera. They like it not in a mild and moderate way, but with their whole hearts. Lohengrin is usually cited as the most romantic of operas, and romantic it is in almost every sense of the word. It is tender, visionary, steeped in the Middle Ages, and also, as the Romantic movement was born in Germany, decisively German. Lohengrin is only partly a timeless story of how a knight in shining armor appears in a dream to a maiden in distress and then comes in human flesh to rescue her. It has other dimensions. The psychological level, for Wagner eventually came to see his characters as archetypes. The autobiographical level, for Wagner never wrote an opera that wasn't in some way about himself. And, Wagner wanted this very much on the surface, the historical level. Lohengrin, which Mark Twain described as a great chorus composed entirely of maniacs in a curious sort of play that brought the audience to their feet in one solid, mighty multitude, is a story about how the German states of Europe once aspired to unity and how for one brief shining moment they almost achieved it, strengthened in their purpose by a sign from heaven. That may sound ominously prophetic when one thinks of the history of Germany in the next century, but there are corresponding sentiments in operas written at the same time on the other side of the Alps by Giuseppe Verdi. German and Italian states alike were struggling towards national unity when Wagner and Verdi began writing. And the two young composers, each a patriot in his own way, thought at the time that their work could and should serve nationalistic purposes. Verdi suffered often at the hands of the political censor, 
and Wagner for his revolutionary views and his participation in the Dresden Uprising of 1849 was driven out of his country soon after he had completed Lohengrin and before he ever had a chance to conduct it. It was Franz Liszt who conducted the premiere with inadequate forces in Weimar the next year. And although triumphant performances of Lohengrin followed throughout Germany, it was a full twelve years before the exiled Wagner could see or hear it. It was a full five years before he was able to hear even a single note of it. In Zurich, in 1853, he gathered together an orchestra for a concert of his own music. And there, rehearsing his players, he heard for the first time the opening measures of the prelude to Act I, with the absolutely new sound of first and second violin sections divided each into four parts and playing in the upper reaches of their registers. He wrote to Liszt, I had to get a good grip on myself not to break down. What Wagner conveyed in those opening measures is a vision in music of what knights of the Middle Ages quested for, the Holy Grail. Out of the clear blue expanses of the sky, there seems to form a wonderful vision. At first, we hardly see it. But gradually there emerges more and more clearly an army of angels bearing in its midst the Holy Grail. Those are Wagner's own words, and he continues. As the vision descends to earth, it pours out fragrance like streams of gold. It ravishes the senses of the man who sees it. The wonder of it grows and grows. until it seems that the joy of it will break of its own tension. At last, the cup appears in all its glory. Radiating beams of fire. Shaking the soul with emotion. He who sees it sinks to his knees in adoration. The grail pours its benediction upon him and consecrates him as its knight.
then the rays gradually dim. The vision soars upward again. to the clear blue expanses of the sky. That prelude, played here by the Vienna Philharmonic under Rudolf Kempe, is a piece of music much admired by men of genius. Baudelaire said it held him suspended in a preternatural state, floating in an ecstasy of insight. Composers who are experts at orchestration, like Tchaikovsky and Richard Strauss, were overawed by Lohengrin's new instrumental combinations. Kurt von Westernhagen rightly remarks that in Lohengrin, Wagner employs the various timbral groups like the different stops of an organ. He could paint any triad in any homogeneous primary color he chose. Lohengrin is famous for its tonal coloring. Gold or shining silver might be suggested by the brass chords of the prelude when the burnished grail appears in its full glory in the bright key of D major. But the wonder of the prelude is how, before and after that, Wagner's divided strings change the effect of a key that is traditionally even brighter, A major, and turn it ethereally soft. A major is made to sound synesthetically like a delicate blue expanse. Thomas Mann spoke lovingly of the blau silberne Schönheit, the silvery blue beauty of Lohengrin. Silvery blue is the color of the mythic world of the grail from which the hero comes. But the colors and sounds change when the prelude is over and we are plunged abruptly into the opera's other world, the turbulent world of history. The curtain rises to a series of fanfares, and we see two armies assembled on the banks of the Skelt near Antwerp in the medieval dukedom of Brabant. We are in the 10th century, and King Henry the Fowler, descendant of Charlemagne, has come with his Saxon cavalry, his herald, his sword, and his great shield to ask the Brabantians to help him fight the Hungarians. His nine-year truce with the eastern hordes is almost over, and they are threatening his empire again. Every Germanic land has a duty to fight in this war, and yet here in Brabant, King Henry says, he finds the people divided. Will Friedrich, Count of Telramund, tell him why this is so? Telramund steps forward, leaving the side of a strikingly beautiful woman who keeps silent during this first act, but steadfastly refuses to blend into the scenery. She is more powerful than he is. She is Ortrud, the unrepentant pagan in this Christian society. Telramund explains that when the old Duke of Brabant died, he was left in charge of the two heirs to the power, the girl Elsa and the boy Gottfried. One day the two children went for a walk in the forest, and Elsa came back alone. Gottfried had disappeared. All searching for him found nothing. Telramund says that he questioned the girl. He saw her grow pale and restless. He was sure she had killed her brother. She was supposed to marry him one day, but now, he says, she fills him with horror. He has taken Ortrud for his wife instead. Then he makes his formal accusation. Elsa is a murderess. He, Telramund, has the rightful claim to the rule of Brabant, and he has the motive for Elsa's fratricide, 
She has a secret lover, and she thought by killing her brother to secure the dukedom for him. Our Telramund here is Dietrich Fischer de Skau. Oh, Dann könnte sie als Herrin von Brabant mit rechtem Lebens an ihre Hand verwehren und offen das geheime Buch entfliegen. The king, sung there by Gottlob Frick, wants to know the other side of this matter, and into this man's world of brass fanfares comes Elsa, accompanied by pure woodwind sounds, dressed in white, surrounded by her ladies, but with no one to champion her cause. At first, like Ortrud, she is silent, even when addressed. Then you admit your guilt, the king asks, Elsa finally speaks, and it is the first woman's voice we have heard in this half hour's time. Mein armer Bruder, she sings, my poor brother. She tells the assemblage how, in the shock of her young brother's disappearance, she prayed and fell asleep and dreamed of a knight in shining armor who seemed to step right out of the air with a golden horn slung on his shoulder and a gleaming sword. The high violins sound the grail music of the prelude, as Elsa sings how, in her dream, the glorious knight told her he would be her defender. Here, as Elsa, is Elizabeth Grimmer. Telramund is sure now that Elsa has a lover. He reminds the German king, In the past I helped you fight the Danes. And Henry admits, I have found no more trustworthy warrior anywhere than Friedrich von Telramund. So the king's only recourse is to let God decide the issue. He declares a Gottesgericht, a trial by combat. But who will fight for Elsa's cause? Now we'll get the name of her lover, Telramund exclaims. The king's herald and his four trumpeters send the royal summons to the four winds. But Elsa's knight, wherever he may be, does not respond, till on the third summons 
she falls on her knees and prays. And suddenly the people sight him coming down the skelt in a little boat, drawn by a swan. It is a wonderful climactic moment, artfully prepared for, for almost an hour. Knight steps ashore and sings, not to Elsa, not to the king or the astonished soldiers, but, strangely, to the swan. Farewell, my faithful swan. Our Lohengrin is Jess Thomas. As Lohengrin sings his Leib Vol, his farewell to the swan, you can hear the swan's two-note motif repeated in the orchestra, the gentle brush of a falling wing or the wail of a sorrowful song. It actually comes out of the first measures of the prelude at the end of this phrase. Wagner was to use that swan theme again in his final opera, Parsifal. 
He drew his Lohengrin story from several medieval sources dealing with Parsifal's son, Loherangrin, perhaps Garin of Lorraine, sent by God to aid the kingdom of Brabant. One prevailing element in the sources is the figure of the swan, which, Wagner said, exercised a singular fascination over my imagination. Germanic folklore abounds with stories of children transformed into swans. A swan draws Loherangrin's boat. A swan boat hero in an old French source fathers a son who fathers the great crusader Godfrey of Bouillon. That is the way mythic stories like the Grail legends spread across Europe in the Middle Ages. Their picturesque details, clustering and combining, and blended often with an element of half-understood history. Wagner's swan turns and draws its little boat up the river again, and the swan knight, whom we shall call Lohengrin, though the others in the opera will not know his name till the last scene, extends his courtesies to King Henry, and then asks Elsa, first, Will she put aside all fear if he champions her cause? Then, will she have him for her husband if he is victorious? Then, strangely, will she promise never to ask his name, what he is, or whence he came? She promises everything. He repeats his third and last question in a higher key to this all-important motif, the forbidden question motif. Nie sollst du mich befragen, never must you ask me. Tchaikovsky must have remembered that theme when he wrote the haunted leading melody in his Swan Lake. Elsa agrees never to ask the forbidden questions, and Lohengrin takes her in his arms and says, Elsa, I love you. No wonder so many little German girls are named Elsa. Then King Henry prays that God direct the outcome. His prayer builds up into an impressive ensemble, the only passage in the whole four-square opera in three-quarter time. Medieval and Renaissance composers thought that triple time symbolized the Trinity. Then the king ceremoniously strikes his great shield three times, the Trinity again, and the combatants square off. Lohengrin quickly fells, Telramund, in some productions, simply by holding his cross-hilted sword on high. Elsa is vindicated. A miracle of grace has been worked in old Brabant. It's a first act that builds steadily and inevitably to its climaxes, an act that Richard Strauss cited to his famous librettist Hugo von Hofmannsthal as ideal in its structure. But the second act surpasses it. Strauss, when he was planning his Rosenkavalier, wrote to Hofmannsthal that he wanted in his second act what Wagner got in the second act of Lohengrin, a sudden, unexpected explosion near the end that would set the entire stage wondering. Unfortunately, Strauss didn't have in Rosenkavalier a character of the explosive force of Wagner's Ortrud. The second act begins with a scene between Ortrud and Telramund that clearly anticipates some of the great dialogues, the dramatic confrontations that Wagner was to write in the ring. Ortrud, who stood the whole length of the first act in silence, singing only in the ensemble, where she expressed her silent thoughts, now comes into her own. It is night, outside the palace and minster of Brabant. Before dawn, the two outcasts must leave the city. The hushed orchestra plays Ortrud's theme, a sinister theme in F-sharp minor that might have come out of Wagner's ring.
Ortrud is convinced that her pagan gods are more powerful than the Christian god who has supplanted them, convinced that her gods will see her into power so that she may reestablish their worship. Wagner gives Ortrud a second theme, the serpent-like temptation theme. Ortrud will tempt Elsa to ask the forbidden question. A fanfare sounds from within the palace. Elsa's vindication is being celebrated. Telramund turns on his consort. She has destroyed his honor. He has given up his god for hers and lost. I have even lost the weapon to kill you with, he says, as he throws himself on the ground in despair. We hear that Ortrud had seduced him in her forest dwelling, telling him of a prophecy that the power in Brabant was to revert to her ancient Frisian line, insisting that she had actually seen Elsa drown her little brother in a pond. Now she has to screw her lover's courage up again. Do you know that if this swan knight were made to tell his name, all his strength would be gone? You've got to work on Elsa. Tell her her knight used magic to win the trial by combat. Tell Ramund, a proud warrior, rises to swear vengeance with Ortrud, ready to believe he has been defeated through magic, eager to reclaim his honor. Then, in an arc of light, Elsa appears in woodwind white on a balcony above to tell the breezes, which used to hear her sorrows, of her new happiness. Her song is punctuated by the sinister voices of the pair in the shadows below. Ortrud, Crystal Ludwig in this recording, sends Telramund away and makes her first move. She calls Elsa's name shiveringly through the night. Ortrud looks up to Elsa and claims that her Telramund is now repentant. And why should she, who has never harmed anyone, go into exile too? Elsa, a good Christian, cannot turn away from the sorrows of others at her own moment of happiness. She leaves the balcony to descend to the courtyard below, and Ortrud, alone on the stage, sings a hair-raising invocation to her pagan gods, Wotan and Freya, asking them to steal her for action, to bless her with deceit, to sweeten her revenge. <laughs>
Elsa appears in the courtyard, asks Ortrud's forgiveness for the sorrow she has caused her, and offers to intercede for Telramund. Ortrud offers, as a return favor, to save Elsa from future unhappiness. Has she ever wondered if the one who came to her by magic might someday leave her the same way? Elsa will not listen, but she trustingly takes the temptress inside the palace. The orchestra reprises Elsa's compassionate melody. Then we hear Ortrud's ominous theme. And Telramund comes out of the shadows to say, Thus evil enters this house. At this halfway point in the act, the dawn breaks, and two pairs of trumpets answer each other from the watchtowers. The king's herald announces that Telramund is banished, that Elsa and her godsent knight will be wed that day, and that on the next, the bridegroom will lead King Henry's armies against the Hungarians. But four discontented noblemen in the crowd wonder why they should follow a foreign king against an enemy who has never attacked them. And suddenly they are joined in the shadows by one who is ready to lead them in rebellion, Telramund. Page boys clear a path for Elsa to the Minster Steps, the biggest ensemble in operatic history, at least as far as 1850, is beginning to build. but the stately bridal procession in which Wagner seems to be pulling out stop after stop on an orchestral and choral organ is, at its climax, blasted to smithereens by the sudden emergence from the midst of the marchers of Ortrud. Mm -hmm. 
the bridegroom, Ortrude cries, that the bride cannot even name. Can you name him? She points at Elsa. You cannot. Do you know where he came from? Because that's where he will go when he leaves you. Elsa, stunned at first, rallies with spirit. Anyone can see that my knight is noble and good. God himself has vindicated me through him. Let the people judge. The people shout their favorable verdict. But Ortrude raises the specter she knows will defeat this medieval populace. He has used magic to win his victory. Then the swan knight himself appears from the palace with King Henry and his Saxons to order Ortrude away. The processional music builds up again, only to be shattered again as Telramund appears to fling into the knight's face the direct charge of using magic, and to shout, Reveal your name. If you won't answer, then the judgment against me has no legal force. I'm not answerable to you, Lohengrin responds, nor even to the king, who never questioned me. I'm answerable only to Elsa. Does she want to ask me anything? Elsa hesitates and the orchestra plays the temptation motif. Telramund sidles up to her to whisper, I'll be nearby on your wedding night. All I need is one tiny wound. If I get that, we'll know what it is he's hiding, what you must know about him. Elsa blanches, No, never. Telramund is driven off. Once again the great bridal ensemble builds up, and moves at last to its conclusion. But when, at the minster portal, Lohengrin takes Elsa in his arms, she sees over his gleaming shoulder the menacing figure of Ortrude, and the orchestra thunders out the theme of the question Elsa is forbidden, but is now very much tempted to ask. <laughs> act of Lohengrin opens with a prelude celebrating Elsa's wedding that is one of the most familiar pieces in the orchestral repertory.
and that is followed by perhaps the most familiar melody from any opera, as, when the curtain rises, Elsa and Lohengrin are escorted to their bedchamber. It comes as a surprise to many brides to discover that the so-called wedding march from Lohengrin was written to accompany the bride's entrance not into the church, but into the bedroom. Wagner's chorus is an epithalamium, that poetic genre familiar to students of literature from Homer and Sappho through Milton and Spencer as the song sung at the Thalamos, the bedchamber, by a crowd eager to see the marriage consummated. At this epithalamium, King Henry presides over the ceremony, anxious to ensure the earthly stay of the man who will bring him more than human aid in his earthly campaign. Then the bride and groom are left alone to sing the scene Franz Liszt thought the finest thing in the score. Surely no composer has put such an intimate, tender moment on the opera stage. But the knight ought not to call his Elsa so often by her name when she does not know his. Can he not tell it to her now that they are alone? She is afraid of the strange power he seems to possess. Can it not destroy him? And what does the swan mean? She imagines she sees it coming on the water to take him away. Has he summoned it already? How long will it be till he leaves her? The music mounts, and Elsa, yielding to the suspicions sown in her mind by Ortrud, asks the forbidden questions. Who is he? What is he? Where has he come from? At that very moment, as if summoned up by her questions, Telramund is there, with his four henchmen, with his sword drawn. Elsa screams and hands her husband his sword. Telramund falls. There is a long silence. Only the timpani sound. Like heartbeats. Then the orchestra remembers Ortrude, for this is her doing. And Lohengrin says, now all our happiness is over. The swan knight bids Telramund's minions take the corpse to the king. A silvery bell tolls once. The curtain falls. And during the scene change, the orchestra plays the noisiest page of the score as Henry's troops marshal on horseback to defend German lands from the eastern hordes. Mark Twain had never heard anything like it, and neither, I suspect, had anyone else at the time. Not in Meyerbeer at his most blatant, not in all the brassy glories of Wagner's own Rienzi and Tannhäuser.
As the king inspects his gathering forces, the corpse of Telramund is borne in. Elsa follows it silently, and her knight appears, dressed as he was at his first appearance. He cannot lead them into battle. That is now forbidden to him. He uncovers the corpse. Was I right to kill this man in self-defense in this night now past? The armies noisily proclaim him right. He announces that Elsa has asked the questions he had forbidden her. Now he will tell them who he is. In a far-off land that your steps can never reach, There is a castle known as Monsalvat. Within it is a shining temple. More wondrous than anything on earth. And in the temple is a cup that works miracles. Guarded by men. Brought from heaven by angels. The cup, Lohengrin says, is the Holy Grail. Once a year, a dove descends from heaven to hover over it and renew its power. It calls knights to its service arms them with more than human might, sends them out to do good deeds, and keeps them safe from death so long as they remain unknown, for the source of the grail's power must be kept secret. And if a knight reveals who he is, he must leave those he has come to help. Now Elsa's knight sings, Hear me while I answer the forbidden questions. I was sent here by the Grail. My father is Parsifal, the Grail's crowned king. I am his knight. My name is Lohengrin. The swan and its little boat reappear. Lohengrin turns to the swan as before and, mysteriously, tells it that it might have been set free, transformed in a year's time, but that now this must be its last journey. He says to the despairing Elsa that had he been able to stay with her that year's time, the Grail would have found the power to restore her young brother to her. If some day her brother does return, she is to give the boy his horn, his sword, and his ring. It is as if Wagner already had Siegfried in mind. Lohengrin bestows the keepsakes on Elsa sings his last farewell, and Ortrud appears suddenly to glory in her triumph. Not only has she destroyed Elsa, she has recognized that the swan is Elsa's brother Gottfried. It still wears around its neck the pendant chain the boy was wearing when she made him disappear. At that, Lohengrin sinks to his knees and prays. The grail's power moves over the scene, we know this because the orchestra sounds the grail theme, and a white dove descends above the swan boat. The dove that descends only once a year, the dove that for grail nights marks the passing of a year. It is as if time and space have been overcome. There is a great line in Wagner's Parsifal where Lohengrin's father, still a young boy, is told by the grail's custodian, 
You see, my son, time becomes space here. Lohengrin takes the chain from the swan, which sinks from view, and a young boy rises from the waves. It is Elsa's brother Gottfried, destined one day to be the greatest of all crusaders. Here is your leader, sings Lohengrin, clasping the boy as King Arthur clasps young Tom of Warwick at the end of Camelot, crying, Here is my victory. Suddenly so much happens we can hardly take it all in in the few seconds that remain. Ortrude screams in defeat at the sight of the boy who kneels in fealty before the king. Then Elsa takes her brother into her arms, but over his shoulder she sees her knight disappearing in the little boat, his head bowed sadly, led away by the grail's dove. Elsa dies in her little brother's arms. But suddenly the busy orchestra has shifted from a tragic D minor to bright A major to the grail motif. And just as we've reached the two notes of it that had symbolized the swan, the melody lifts instead to a last triumphant A major chord. And now it's time for us to ask, what does it mean? Let's start with the autobiographical element. It's clear that Wagner didn't plan this consciously. It's equally clear, when we view his work as a whole, that every Wagner hero is a projection of Wagner himself. Each hero comes to a closed society as an outsider and is, sometimes sooner and sometimes later, rejected. Each hero has some problem with his name. Lohengrin and the Dutchman reveal theirs only at the end. Tannhäuser is never called by his. Parsifal has to be told his. Tristan disguises himself as Tantris and Siegmund as Weywald. Walter, a Franconian knight, is at first rejected by the bourgeois master singers of Nuremberg. They begin, these heroes, to fall into a pattern, some of it due to the myths, legends, and traditions in the sources, but some of it due as well to Wagner's rearrangement of those sources. Wagner's heroes are all lonely, pseudonymous outsiders seeking redemption in one faithful woman. They are figures with whom Wagner, consciously or no, identified. Like Lohengrin, Wagner the Dresden insurgent hoped to light the way to German unity. He failed in that, and he was rejected again and again by closed societies. And though he needed and sought a woman to be his helpmate, it wasn't until long after Lohengrin that he found one, not in his first wife Minna, who he discovered could never share his creative life, but in his second wife, Franz Liszt's daughter, Cosima, who gave him support for the rest of his days and beyond, and never questioned the wonders he worked in his art. But that was years later. When Wagner wrote the essay called A Communication to My Friends, when he tried to understand and explain what he had wrought in Lohengrin, he saw the opera as a tragedy of the artist who puts his faith in the power of love to understand when the world about him has lost the ability to love or understand. And Wagner realized that there was another dimension to his Lohengrin, in Elsa. He saw her first as a German counterpart to Greek Semele. In classical myth, the sky god Zeus left his Olympian light to love the mortal woman Semele, and in the darkness, she asked him to reveal himself to her openly in all his glory. He had told her never to ask that, but, out of love for her, he appeared to her in all his sunlit brilliance, and the full sight of him killed her. Like most myths, this is about the human psyche. 
Man and woman, Wagner said, are like two parts of the soul. He is consciousness, power, and light. She is the unconscious, the dark intuitive. Each fulfills the longings of the other. Wagner identified with the man when, politically committed, he wrote the crusading Lohengrin. Later, writing the intuitive ring, he looked back on Lohengrin and saw that the woman was part of him too, and an essential part of him, his questioning intuition, the true source of his creativity. Elsa, he then exclaimed, Elsa, the unconscious, the intuitive, in whom Lohengrin's consciousness and reason long to be fulfilled, Elsa, the true feminine, who can save me and the world, Elsa, the feminine, hitherto not understood by me, now understood at last. Ernest Newman, reading that confession, said, Well, who in the name of heaven takes Lohengrin and Elsa so seriously as that? Andrew Porter responded, rightly, Wagner did. Wagner, when he said it, was clearly moving on to Brynhilde, the questioning, intuitive, saving woman of the ring. He was remembering the eternal feminine that saved Faust at the end of Goethe's drama. And he was strikingly anticipating modern psychologies, wherein the human person seeks wholeness, integration, and union between consciousness, the male principle, and the unconscious, the female principle. With Lohengrin and the ring, Wagner began to realize what he was doing in his art. He was, quote, making the unconscious conscious. He was mapping out that lost continent that lies beneath reason, exploring the world we usually experience in dreams or know from myths. Breaking an imposed taboo is a familiar motif in myth. Wagner mentions Semele. There is also Psyche, whose very name means soul. In the darkness, Psyche lit a lamp and looked on her divine lover, though he had told her not to, and she lost him. She also opened a jar from the world of the dead she was told not to look into, and fell into a deathly sleep. Then there is the first woman in Greek myth, Pandora, whose name means all gifts. She was given a box and told not to open it, but she did, and found that it was filled with all evils. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, there is the most famous of these taboo-breaking women, Eve. Tempted by the serpent, she ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which she was told not to do. And so she ended, for herself and for her Adam, a life of preternatural bliss, and brought immediate sorrow to herself and suffering to all her descendants. And what, along with the breaking of the imposed taboo, have all these stories of disobedient women in common? Instant sorrow, but ultimate good. For when Semele is destroyed, her unborn child is rescued. He is Dionysus, irrational god of the dark unconscious. And when Psyche is wakened from her deathly sleep, her lover makes her immortal. He is Eros, irrational god of love. And when Pandora unleashes all evils upon the world, she finds one last winged creature inside the box, Elpis, the hitherto unknown spirit of hope for the world. Instant sorrow ultimate good, the emergence into the world of a new power. The Church in her liturgy calls Eve's breaking of the taboo a felix culpa, a happy fault, because it began the whole wonderful plan of God's redemption of the human race and in time brought the world talem redemptorem, a great redeemer in Christ. I think mythologists agree, and I think that all but the most fundamentalist Christian writers agree, that these taboo-breaking stories describe a great evolutionary moment 
in human prehistory, when the race passed from a blissful state of unconsciousness, a state when humans lived through instinct and intuition, to the much more problematic state of consciousness, when reason emerged and the race came to know what was good and what was evil. At first, this may have seemed a catastrophe, a tragic loss. Ultimately, it was a triumph. Man evolved, emerged into a state where he was fully conscious, but with his psyche still rooted in the unconscious. And if it is the woman in all these myths who takes the evolutionary step first, it is not because she is the more frail, it is because she is the more intuitive. She knows intuitively that the step must be taken. Then, despite immediate loss, there is ultimately progress. And what of Lohengrin's most eloquent symbol, the swan? The mythmakers of the Dark and Middle Ages, the best intuitors in our Western tradition, put the swan into their version of the woman breaking the taboo myth. What does the swan mean? Dictionaries of mythological symbols indicate that the swan was associated in medieval alchemy with the god Mercury, the messenger of God to man, and a harbinger of change. In modern times, Jungians have called the swan a transcendence symbol. The swan in Lohengrin seems, on the historical level, to be a heaven-sent sign that the German states may now move towards a new stage in their history, towards unity and integration. On the autobiographical level, the swan may be a symbol of Wagner's art, which brings his God-given transforming insights to us who listen. But on the deepest mythical level, the swan is witness to the existence of a transcendent power beyond the world we know, a power that can, in a moment of grace, touch our natural world and change it. I won't say that this is all the swan means, for myths are always wiser than any interpretations drawn from them. But it is clear that transformations are happening quickly with the transformation of the swan at the close of Lohengrin. Ortrude's power deserts her, Lohengrin goes back to the grail, Elsa dies, and young Gottfried appears to take his rightful place as the hope for the future. Elsa's asking the forbidden question brings instant sorrow to her and her beloved, but ultimately provides a living symbol for her people. It actually speeds the progress of change. Had Elsa not asked the question, Gottfried might have been restored to his people in a year's time. But the disunited German states need a symbol now. So Elsa's intuitive questioning and Lohengrin's prayerful acceptance of it brings to earth the dove that only once a year descends to give the grail its power. In effect, a whole year passes those last quick moments when the swan is transformed into Gottfried, who appears like Dionysus or Eros or Elpis, or Jesus, after the taboo has been broken. The chorus sings as its last word, sorrow. But Wagner's orchestra, with the omniscience that it was to have forever after, plays the grail theme without the swan in it, for a transcendent power has worked the needed transformation. On the last page of the score, the end of the grail theme does not fall with the swan motif, but with a simple chord progression lifts to a final shining silver-blue chord. I don't believe that Wagner consciously planned all this, but I do believe he intuited it. Why haven't any of our critics seen this in Lohengrin? 
perhaps because nine plot synopses out of ten will tell you that it was Ortrud who changed young Gottfried into a swan. But Ortrud recognizes that the swan is Gottfried only when she sees the chain with which she enchanted the boy still hanging on the swan's neck. She made Gottfried disappear, but was it she who turned him into a swan? Could it not have been the Grail's power, a power for good, that preserved the boy till the danger was past as that beautiful transcendent symbol? In Wagner's medieval sources, it is a power for good that preserves threatened children as swans. Wagner, as he got deeper into his subject, struck out a passage in his first draft that might have indicated it was an evil power that effected the transformation. And musically, the swan is associated not with Ortrud's F-sharp minor, but with the Grail's ethereal A major. It was the Grail that saved Gottfried from Ortrud by changing him into this symbolic form, and then sent him back to the land he would one day rule with the knight who knew who he was, who would defeat the evil that had almost destroyed him, and restore him, a boy again, to his rightful throne when the danger was past. Many a storybook prince, like Camelot's King Arthur, is metamorphosed into a bird or a beast, to be preserved for a time from harm, and to learn from his experience in the animal kingdom how to govern his people when he grows up and becomes king. It's a romantic idea, and it appealed powerfully to a romantic young king who didn't know how to govern but wished he did, who wasn't chaste but longed to be, who loved Lohengrin and built swan castles, even a lake with a swan boat in it, to externalize his longings. Perhaps that young king, Wagner's patron Ludwig II, should have the last say on Lohengrin, he sensed that the swan was a transcendent symbol and no king wanted to find a transcendent world to help him more than he did. All the same, I'll save the last say for myself. I love Lohengrin. When I see or hear it, like some Monheimer in the days of Mark Twain, I'm held in a spell. Like Baudelaire, I'm suspended in a preternatural state blended of ecstasy and insight. I can sense that there is a world that transcends this one, and that in one brief shining moment it can touch me. I can sense, too, that I am made to be more than I am. There are transformations that can still be worked in me, in my consciousness and my intuition, in my masculine and my feminine. Even if I fail, all is not lost. Truly human failings can be happy faults. And at the end of all is an A major silver-blue beauty. Maybe that's only a fairy tale vision, a romantic 19th century vision of reality. But there are contemporary thinkers who would not say it was false. The intuitive Wagner discovered the mythic truth in his romantic tale from centuries past. As we have discovered in our own century, myths are about what happens or can happen within all of us. Within each of us, Lohengrin can happen on the landscape and the skyscape of the soul. <laughs>